Everything vibrates. Everything. Our reality is such that frequencies have a much more profound effect on us than we've been previously led to believe. This basic fundamental fact can no longer be ignored. As technologically advanced as we're constantly told we are these days, there are some technologies that are just now being presented to the public as new when they're not new at all, but have simply been widely suppressed for decades. Things like the new digital neuro headbands that pulse specific electromagnetic frequencies into a person's head to change people's moods, for example. People are buying these now. This is a thing. But it was proven that that type of technology worked decades ago. It has also come out in recent years that frequencies can cure diseases, including cancer. Professor Anthony Holland even gave a TED talk called Shattering Cancer with Resonant Frequencies a couple years back, where he discussed that specific oscillating pulse electrical fields can destroy everything from cancer cells to MRSA. Over the course of 15 months, we try hundreds and hundreds of frequencies, if not thousands, until we find the magic combination. The answer is you have to have two input frequencies, one low, one high, and the higher frequency must be 11 times the lower. It's what we musicians would call the 11th harmonic. And when we add the 11th harmonic, we begin to shatter microorganisms like a crystal glass. Not that you probably heard about it on the nightly news or anything. As someone pointed out in the comments on his video, phrases like, they hadn't seen anything like it and it seems to be a new phenomenon, made viewers who know about the organized suppression of such technologies since at least the 1930s want to slam their own heads into a wall. If you haven't heard of Dr. Royal Raymond Reif, this is someone who's been referred to by those who personally knew him as a genius. He was a scientist and inventor, and starting in the 20s, he began building a large, very complex microscope capable of magnifying objects 31,000 times, compared with the maybe 1,700 times that were available on standard microscopes in the 30s and 40s. By 1940, he had invented a two-foot microscope weighing 200 pounds that included 5,682 parts, which enabled him to see viruses and bacteria in a way that no other scientist had at that time. Because these organisms were so tiny, he designed a method of staining them with light. And through this work, he came to understand that living things, including pathogens and viruses and bacteria, have their own frequency or oscillation pattern. And just like a specific musical note can shatter a wine glass if sung at the resonant frequency of the glass, he found specific frequencies could be used when matched up with specific pathogens in order to destroy them. And as he continued to isolate viruses and bacteria and locate their frequencies, he also claimed he discovered the virus responsible for cancer. Using resonance, or what he termed the mortal oscillatory rate of the virus, he was able to kill it in laboratory experiments over and over and over. He completed hundreds of experiments on tumors and rats purposefully infected with the isolated cancer virus before ever attempting to use these frequencies on people. In 1934, he famously tested out his device on 16 terminally ill cancer patients. Out of 16, 14 of them, all but two, were certified medically cured in just three months. Of his treatment, Reif would later write, with the frequency instrument treatment, no tissue is destroyed, no pain is felt, no noise is audible, and no sensation is noticed. A tube lights up and three minutes later the treatment's completed, the virus or bacteria is destroyed, and the body then recovers itself naturally from the toxic effect of the virus or bacteria. Several diseases may be treated simultaneously. His findings were at first widely published. In June of 1940, the LA Times reported, for organisms too small to be stained, an ingenious illuminating system is used. The system utilizes Reif's theory that organisms respond to certain wavelengths, a theory he carries to finality by bombarding disease germs with radio waves which are tuned to those of the minute man-killers. And the virus he says occurs in cancer has, Reif insists, disintegrated under such radio waves. Reif was hailed in the scientific and medical communities for his discoveries. At first... 
By 1937, he'd established a company called Beamray with several colleagues, and 14 of his machines were manufactured. Multiple doctors used these machines, tested them out, and saw that they worked. It wasn't just Reif's word. So what happened? Why aren't these machines in every hospital and cancer treatment center in the world today? Why don't we have them? Simply put, the only cancer Reif couldn't seem to kill was greed. Powerful opposition with vested interest in allopathic, that is the pharmaceutical and surgery-based medicine system, and the still infant cancer treatment called chemotherapy, and medical professionals linked to the Rockefeller Foundation with its deeply entrenched eugenics-based population control agenda, would make absolutely sure that Rife's machines would never be available to the public at large. If you notice an absence of stethoscopes, thermometers, and other medical paraphernalia, don't let it upset you. This doctor doesn't go in for them. He's got something better. She doesn't even have to undress. The machine will find out what's wrong. The modern counterpart of the ancient medicine man. He's traded in his boar's tooth and magic wand for an electrical appliance. But his stock in trade is still ignorance and superstition. The 20th century witch doctor talks in terms of atomic rays and supersonic vibrations. He's what's generally referred to as a quack doctor. But somehow that term just doesn't cover my feelings on the subject. To me, the term murderer is much more appropriate. One such big pharma stooge was Dr. Morris Fishbane, head for a time of the American Medical Association and described by Bob Wallace on LouRockwell.com as a shakedown artist hell-bent on destroying naturopathic medical inventors he couldn't buy out. The story goes that Fishbane sent an attorney to make a token attempt to buy out Rife, and Rife refused. And although no one knows the exact terms of the offer, it was probably similar to the one Fishbane made to Harry Hoxie for his herbal cancer remedy, which Fishbane later had to admit in court worked on skin cancer. On a television screen, it must look very much like a jar of chocolate syrup. It's not. It's cancer salve, and it's deadly. It's killed before it'll kill again. When it doesn't kill, it maims. It never cures. Fishbane and his associates would receive all the profits for nine years, and Hoxie would receive nothing. Then if they were satisfied it worked, Hoxie would begin to get 10% profits. When Hoxie refused, Fishbane and his political mafia went after him, and they had Hoxie arrested 125 times in a period of just 16 months. The charges were always based on practicing without a license, and they were always thrown out in court, but Fishbane ended up harassing this Hoxie guy for 25 years this way. The only good thing that came out of any of it is that the scandal ultimately forced Fishbane to resign. Fishbane also offered Phil Hoyland, who was an investor in Rife's Beamray company and an electrical engineer who helped build the frequency machines, legal assistance, basically an attempt to steal the company out from under Rife and the other investors. And in 1939, a lawsuit ensued. And that was the beginning of the end of Rife and his machines. Unable to withstand the criticisms and attacks on his character and his life's work in court, Rife crumbled and turned to alcoholism, despite the fact that he ultimately won his case. But the legal costs bankrupted him and Beam Ray went out of business. And Fishbane continued to wield all the power of the AMA to halt any further proper scientific investigation into Rife's claims or his machines. Doctors that had previously supported Rife suddenly fell silent. One of his partners, Arthur Kendall, all of a sudden retired to Mexico after receiving a magical gift of a quarter of a million dollars from guess who. Other doctors were given large grants and AMA honors to keep their mouths shut and go back to prescribing pharmaceuticals. Major medical journals, which are all predominantly funded by big pharma advertising revenues, refused to publish anyone's work involving Rife's theories or his machines or any of it. And on top of that, Rife's lab was broken into, documentation of his work including photographs, and even pieces of his microscope were stolen and vandalized. Then, in what would be too much coincidence for even a Hollywood movie, the multi-million dollar Burnett Lab in New Jersey was torched and destroyed just as its scientists were about to corroborate Rife's findings. Police then illegally confiscated the rest of his research. And the story starts to have a whole lot of similarities with Wilhelm Reich, but that's another story for another time. And that was about it. 
Fishbane would go down in history with a prestigious write-up of his medical career based on exposing quacks, or alternatively, financial enemies of Big Pharma's chemical and surgery-based medical model. And it wasn't just Fishbane. There was a coordinated effort to ensure that other doctors didn't even attempt to follow in Rife's footsteps. Dr. Cornelius P. Rhodes, an oncologist, Rockefeller Institute alum, and head of the Chemical Warfare Service during the last two years of World War II, spent two decades from 1939 to 1959 as the head of Memorial Sloan Kettering, the nation's premier chemotherapy advocate, where Rhodes was helping to shape the newly emerging quote-unquote treatment of cancer with chemotherapy. He too prevented other doctors from even attempting to replicate Rife's work pulling strings to get research funding canceled for those who even dared to try. Rhodes not only prevented Dr. Irene Diller from announcing the discovery of the cancer microorganism to the New York Academy of Sciences in 1950, but he got Dr. Caspi slapped with a nasty IRS investigation and her laboratory funds canceled after she announced a similar discovery in Rome three years later in 1953. Rhodes, it should be pointed out, would also go down in history as a potential murderer. In the 1930s, when Rhodes was sent down to Puerto Rico for the Rockefeller's Anemia Commission, he had a drunken night where he returned back to his house to find his car had been vandalized and proceeded to write a disgusting racist confession of both murder and attempted murder by injecting people with cancer to a colleague. He wrote they, they being Puerto Ricans, are beyond doubt the dirtiest, laziest, most degenerate and thievish race of men ever inhabiting this sphere. It makes you sick to inhabit the same island with them. They are even lower than Italians. What the island needs is not public health work, but a tidal wave or something to totally exterminate the population. It might then be livable. I have done my best to further the process of extermination by killing off eight and transplanting cancer into several more. The latter has not resulted in any fatalities so far. The matter of consideration for the patient's welfare plays no role here. In fact, all physicians take delight in the abuse and torture of the unfortunate subjects. Thirteen people died under Rhodes' quote-unquote care in Puerto Rico. And the Rockefeller public relations firm got into full swing, coming out to say that Rhodes was simply writing a fantastic and playful letter for his own amusement. A satire piece, if you will. Because as we all know, when you're just in a playful mood, that's the kind of letter that you write. Token investigations, including one by the Rockefeller Institute, ensued and claimed there was no evidence that Rhodes had abused or neglected his patients. But as far as history is concerned, you can believe Rhodes' letter hasn't been featured too prominently in his otherwise illustrious biography as a chemotherapy pioneer. To me, the term murderer is much more appropriate. And today, how many people have needlessly died from cancer that could have quickly, painlessly, inexpensively, and easily been cured by rife technology in the years since his research was purposefully suppressed? It's a horrifying thought. My mother almost died from cancer. She was diagnosed back in 2007, and they gave her a grueling chemotherapy treatment set that included one she later found out wasn't even for the type of cancer she was diagnosed with. They just threw it in, like a little added bonus. And when all was said and done, and her immune system had been utterly destroyed, but her cancer went into remission, the doctors turned around and informed her that it would probably come back in five to 10 years. That is not a cure. The reason the average person still believes dangerous and toxic chemotherapy cures cancer today is the same greedy force behind why most people still fuel their cars with gasoline despite the fact that much more efficient, inexpensive, and environmentally sound alternatives have existed for decades but have also been suppressed until recently. Greed, however, can't keep the truth hidden from humanity forever, especially those truths which are so fundamentally obvious and becoming more obvious by the day. It's 2017. How many years have people been donating money to cancer research and running for the cure without so much as a peep from the allopathic medicine system about the cause? Albeit quietly, we now have researchers coming out of the woodwork left and right to verify the power of resonant frequencies to kill viruses and bacteria and diseases, including cancer. Two doctors in 2014 published a paper in Global Advances in Health and Medicine titled Life Rhythm is a Symphony of Oscillatory Patterns, Electromagnetic Energy and Sound Vibration Modulates Gene Expression for Biological Signaling and Healing. It's a very interesting paper. 
and in it they concluded not only chemicals and physical energies like EMFs and sound vibrations, but even our emotions, thoughts, beliefs, and the way we develop our intentions and life rhythms can deeply transform our gene expression patterning at the cellular level. This finding may disclose unexpected chances to develop self-healing processes based on further utilization of this remarkable human potential. The paradigm emerging here moves from a purely biochemical viewpoint based solely upon physical concepts of energy and momentum transfer and their implications for biochemistry to a holistic information-based paradigm. Much as a whisper might carry more gravitas than shouted words, science may now be uncovering the basic principles of a more subtle informational biology in which specific signaling behaviors can carry the power for healing. We were meant to heal. We were made to heal. We all know how well the big pharma medical model of filling ourselves up with chemicals and ripping out all our vital organs has served us. These aren't cures. It's sick care, not health care. It's only a matter of time before the medical and scientific communities are going to be forced to admit that Rife was right, or they'll risk losing the last few shreds of credibility they even have, if they have any, in a world where it's become all too obvious we've been purposefully held hostage in a technology bubble.